Um, we continue in our conversation today and uh, uh, into some of the subtle uh, areas of our everyday lives, some practical things. We've been on this collection train for quite a while called From Here to There and Back Again. And today is something simple but subtle. And I, I do believe that it is something that affects everybody at every age, every gender, every background, every economic level, because we are all recipients. Sometimes we're more aware that we're recipients than others. Sometimes that we're, we, we live our lives in such a way that we're so busy and cluttered that we can miss some of the basics. I brought with me a couple props this morning. Uh, these are these are tools that uh, are fun for me. I uh, don't know if you know these things. This is called uh, this company is called Aerobi, and uh, this bad boy will fly at uh, about a length of a football field. It's like a frisbee. You throw it like a frisbee. Then they came out with this other product, and this is a modern day boomerang. And uh, so you know you th you throw it and it takes a big circle and comes you know, right back to you on paper. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I love fooling around with these things. And today we're going to talk about what I'm going to call the boomerang effect. Because life, as you're going to see, and as you know already, uh, is uh, we live this boomerang effect. Let me, let me explain. We begin in Matthew chapter 7 today. This is the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus speaking his first publicly recorded message. He may have spoken before, but this is the, what we have on record as his first talk. He's speaking to many people, and he's giving just kind of a bullet point list of principles, life principles. One of them goes like this in Matthew chapter 7. Do not judge, or you'll have a boomerang effect. You'll too be judged. For in the same way you judge others from here to there, so I'm judging from here to there, there's going to be a back, or back again boomerang effect. You also be judged. With the measure, measure you use, that boomerang was going to come right back. That's the measure that will come back to you. Now, as you, if you study this passage, there's some uh, variety. There's a variety of uh, perspectives, and that's not unusual. You can take almost any Bible passage, and you get different perspectives. and And some people believe that this is God. So if I'm critical, then God's going to be critical back to me. That if I, He's going to pay me back. Uh, and so, I, you know, for me, I don't want to live my life thinking that God's just getting even all the time. Uh, you know, some people may think that, believe that, but you know, I, I make a miss move. God's going to make a miss move. It's all, all going to come back to me. Uh, it could be true, you know, but I think God's got bigger things to do than run around behind any of us. Like, okay, you did that to the third degree. I'm going to do that to the third degree. Right. And it, I don't, I don't think that's, you know, uh, at least the character of God that I know in the Bible. What I do think though, is that there is a natural boomerang effect when we, as human beings, what I mean by that, if you talk behind people's back a lot, there's something in you in that experience that you're paranoid that other people are talking about you. The measure that you're putting out is the measure that you often get. You walk into a room and you're, you, know, you look crabby, most likely people will treat you as such. I used to have a friend, uh, we did music together. We sang on Broadway for years and years. And uh, he just had this electric personality. His name was Harry, uh, died from COVID a couple of years ago. But Harry would walk in a room and he was like, yeah, great to see you. And you, even if you're having the worst day, you're like, yeah, it's great to see you. There's this kind of boomerang effect that happens. My wife and I talk a lot about this, this uh, talk we heard years ago at the Global Leadership Summit by a guy named Joseph Grinney. He wrote this book that's called Crucial Conversations. And he notes that there is a mechanism in our, in our genetic makeup and the natural engineering that God put in that's called fight or flight. So that when people, when you're going to have a difficult conversation and you start that difficult conversation by a couple words like, look, bucko, then the person receiving that 
is either going to go into, you know, they're going to coil or they're going to like, okay, I'm, I'm going to, you know, so when you, you know, you shoot that text, it's a little bit stinging. You, you can expect the boomerang effect. If on the other hand, if you're going to have a conversation, um, I have at my age learned to say at the beginning, hey, this is going to be a little bit of a tougher conversation, but I want you to know I love you enough to have it. Boy, it's a whole different aspect than look bucko, right? Here's what Grenny writes in his book, Crucial Conversation. When you find yourself in an uncomfortable situation, do you clam up or do you go on the offensive? We're genetically conditioned to enter a fight or flight mentality when we find ourselves in less than safe situations. Our breathing quickens, our adrenaline shoots through our bodies, our blood throws to, flows through our limbs, better enabling us to respond physically. So it's kind of a protective measure that God has put into us. Like we're either going to like, hey, I'm out of here or hey, I'm going to I'm going to defend myself. It's just a natural thing. So if you don't believe that yet, let me just let me throw a, a, few, a few thoughts out to you. We're going to talk about some areas that I that affect everybody relational love, how we treat one another, our sense of grit and sacrifice as Christ followers, and, and uh, uh, this uh, having a sense of, of giving back and being generous because we have a model that we're going to see. Let me read uh, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Watch this. So in everything you do, do to others what you would have them do to you. You see the boomerang. And then Jesus said, for this sums up the entire Bible as they knew it, the law and the prophets. That was the Old Testament. In other words, when you talk to people, when you text people, when you're driving in traffic, the way you want it to return to you, that's the way you're going to do it. Does it work 100% of the time? No, it doesn't. I uh, One time back in, the, in my past, I was a... Um, a choir director, and um, we had auditions to get in the choir, and it was a rather large choir, and I had this gal show up, and uh, she didn't audition. She was just sitting in the choir, in the choir rehearsal, and we had sunny evening service right after choir rehearsal. And uh, I'm a bad singer, so one bad singer can recognize another bad singer. She was really bad. She was like 400 degrees below Steve's ability. At least I can keep the melody, right? She was, and, and not only was she a bad singer, she was a loud bad singer. So before we went into the evening service, I pulled her aside. I'm like, hey, you know, this is what, this is what worship pastors, this is the conversation. This is the conversation. You know, God gives us in different ways. That's how, that's how it all begins. <laughs> he gives us gifts, some in music, some not. You know, you kind of <laughs> wink when you say that, some not, you know. I think it's when I ask her if, if she would consider bowling that, uh, <laughs> that took it over the top. No, I'm just kidding. So I said, I just, don't, I just don't think this is your gift, you know, as nicely as I could. And she goes, well, my parents are coming to church tonight. I'm like, that's great. That's great news. And then after that, I can't quite repeat on a Sunday morning what came out of her mouth, but it was pretty rugged. So it's not a guarantee that the boomerang always comes back, but the command is that we do it anyway. Here's what uh, John Maxwell writes. He said, if you want to treat others more kindly, you must develop better people skills. The great writer Goethe said this, the way you see people is the way that you treat them. And the way that you treat them is what they become. So let me go into the spiritual realm. Because you might think, oh, this is just a self-help talk to help us to treat each other better. But the bigger point and the more subtle point and some, some lenses that I'm inviting us to put on together is that in our relationship with God, the here is God, and the there is us, and we are to give it back again. In other words, check this out in 1 John chapter 4. We love only because he loved us first. 
The only reason that you have one ounce of love in you is because God started it. We don't love God because we're great people. We don't love God because we're super religious. We don't love God because we're spiritual. We only love God because he's the first one that flung the boomerang. It came to us, and now we give it back. So in other words, we are recipients of love from God, and the expectation is that we boomerang that thing back to God. Watch this in John chapter 15, verse 12. This is my commandment that you love each other as I have loved you. There's the model. So the boomerang effect is kind of an imitation effect. We find it here in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Be kind, compassionate to one another because I said so. God could have said that. I say we have no, this is where, you know, as Christians or anything, you know, you go to the gym every week and you kind of start taking it for granted. You, you go to your favorite restaurant, you start taking it for granted. You know, when I go to Sarasota, like I mentioned, you know, a few weeks ago to Pittsburgh, man, when I'm in Pittsburgh, man, do I love Sarasota. You know, it's just kind of like when you step away from it. And when we're living in God and we're singing about grace and amazing grace and love, you can kind of get used to it. You can kind of get inoculated to it. And you can also get inoculated to the fact that we actually get to know God. Because if you took any amount of time to dig down further respectfully in other religions, God is a mysterious black hole. You can't know him like we can know God through Christ. You can only know that he is... He is big, he is mysterious, and, and man, or multiple, there's polytheistic uh, religions where like, which one do you actually know since there are hundreds of them? We get to know the God of the universe. We are only loving because we know he modeled it. It's not just some mysterious deity that says, you love each other, and that's the end of it. No, we love each other because we got to see a God of the universe demonstrate his love that while we were still broken eggs, David, while we were still fractured, while our yoke was running out, when you were saying that, I was going to make a joke, but it didn't seem like the appropriate time. You know, if I were dropping an egg off the roof, I'd want it to be scrambled because that's how I feel my life is. I'm scrambled, right? God loved us when we were broken, scrambled, rotten eggs. And he did that not just by some fable. He did that not just by some preset. He did that by stepping in our dirt and laying himself on a cross. Amen. Now we know what it looks like. Now we got it. So he says, be kind, compassionate to one another. Hey, let it go. If you got something against somebody, forgive your neighbor, your uncle, your co-worker. Forgive one another. Why? Just as Christ boomeranged it to you, boomerang it back as he forgave you. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us. There it is again, and gave himself up as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. I think that the creation of man in Genesis chapter 1 is sets the, the stage, the purpose of, of every person that knows God. What do I mean by that? We were created in the image of God, in the likeness of God. And this is our purpose, to portray to the world not what we know, but who God is. Not what we know about God, but showing God in our lives. People don't really care about, you know, all the facts about God. They want to see a reality in your life. Let me give an example. A few years ago, uh, my wife and I, we went and I took the boys. We went to the Middle East. I had several trainings. One of the trainings was in a, uh, we would call a hot area, uh, an area that was uh, dangerous. We felt like a born movie, to be honest with you. We were staying at a place where there were bomb sniffing dogs at our car, uh, uh, total open the car, mirrors underneath the car, you know, so you could just feel, hey, you know, we're not in... We're not in Sarasota anymore. And uh, we, would, we drove to this church, and uh, the, the name of one of the 9-11 terrorists was named after this city. 
and that's where he lived. Uh, we came by night. Uh, we learned later that there was national level security all around the, the neighborhood, going through the neighborhood because we were Americans. We uh, were in this little teeny car jammed up going through the little back streets. You see the women dressed, uh, most of them all in black. You hear the droning of the, the, you know, the towers, the Islamic towers. And there's just, you, you, I can't even describe it as I'm trying to describe to you, this feeling of oppression, of darkness, of danger, not happiness. It's just, it's thick, okay? So we're going through these streets and we're getting close to the church, which is behind about a 10-foot cinder block uh, wall. As we turned the corner, we were shocked that there was about a 25 to 30 foot neon purple cross. I'm like, you know, I didn't play that out in my head like that. And I'm like, in my mind, like, that is just great, but great slash bizarre in this setting. And what, so of course, we're gonna like, how do you do that? Uh, quite frankly, to be honest with you, you know, with, with county codes, I don't know if I could do that on my corner right now. <laughs> Not because of religious reasons, because, well, we don't want something purple and neon that's 30 foot tall, right? But I'm like, how do you get that? And so as we spent time at the church, here's what we found out they have a free dental clinic, they have a clinic for abused women, which in that faith, the Islamic faith, there's a lot of. We, they, had a, they had a whole uh, counseling for troubled teens. They made soap for people that couldn't afford it. I mean, one thing after the next. And they said, they don't want us to leave. They don't want us because they have tossed the boomerang out into the community that you would never believe. And it's coming back from people that may not necessarily believe in Christ. But we recognize that this must be what God is like. They probably don't have much concern about the fourth verse of Revelation chapter 12. But they want to find a God who is compassionate. That's the power of that. Here's a second area. Let me just start by this way. Grit is contagious. Grit is, has this boomerang effect. What do I mean by that? When you're around people that are sacrificing, this is one of the beautiful things about a mission trip. Because you're like, you're in a different environment, it's hot, you're not eating what you normally eat, you're staying at places that are not places that you normally live, there's a different language, and everybody has this kind of feel like, hey, we're digging deeper here, right? We're going to, listen. we didn't come to have, just to have fun, we didn't come to be comfort, live in comfort, we came to dig in, and there's something that happens in a team like that. And then you might see a Dora Schweppe, who is seasoned in her in her age of life and you think man you just see her pour it out and see her non-stop and then you think man i can do that too see there's a boomerang effect about being around people i work i do a, a morning workout i see this older couple every morning and when i don't feel like it i just look to them i'm like dang they never miss a day they're out here, they got their towel, sweating, and this, that, and the other. They never miss a day. See, we look at Christ, and we find that Christ's love compels us, 2 Corinthians 5, because we are convinced that he died. He was injured, he was beaten, therefore all died. See, he died for all, that those who live should no longer live to themselves because we got a model of grit. We got a model of sacrifice. So it's hard to understand for us as Christ followers who, if we don't want to sacrifice because we are following someone who sacrificed, you see? In other words, if we're not living a sacrificial life, the boomerang, quite frankly, got hung up in a tree somewhere. It's not coming back. 
So now from now on, we don't regard someone from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in such a way, we no longer do so. I love Hebrews 11, as many of us do. It talks about those who have sacrificed, those who have pushed through, those who were sawn in half, those who were crucified, those who, were, who gave their lives. And so Hebrews 12, 1 starts this, since we are on such an amazing sacrificing team, since those who have gone before us throw out the, the boomerang, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, now let us, our turn. So when you, when you look at these two instruments here, <laughs> this one goes straight. It doesn't come back. So if I threw it out, Joe, if I threw it to Joe, sorry. <laughs> hey, how dare you take notes during a sermon? <laughs> Could you throw that back someone? <laughs> um, this one does come back. <laughs> I did it one time. Hey, where's the other one? Can I get that back? Someone, I, yeah. All right, come on. Give it a shot. Hey, what, could, what could be that? And we can just break a camera. Excellent. I'll give you some lessons. <laughs> you throw about like I do, man. <laughs> Look, you know, we are either living in a way that we're just getting, we're receiving, or we're boomeranging. If we got into this game called Christianity for our own sense of peace with God alone, for our own sense of like, oh good, because I was going to hell and now I'm not, our own sense of wisdom an instruction without the sacrificial part we're throwing with the frisbee that we just caught. And the, and the Christianity of the Bible, listen, is a boomerang. So it may be, I have to, at time, from time to time, make sure I'm living out the Bible version of Christianity and not the Steve version of Christianity. Since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, now let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles the trees around us that catch our boomerangs. And let us run, here it is, with grit, with perseverance, the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author, perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him. It is the secret of the boomerang life. You got, listen, you got to watch those who are sacrificing. If you're watching those who are taking it easy, trust me, you'll take it easy. You got to live around people. You got to watch people. If somebody's at the gym and they're only lifting two pound dumbbells, don't look at them. Because you're over there with your five pounder like, oh yeah, pressing it down, right? <laughs> Look at somebody who is pushing it really hard and you will push it really hard. Look at the older couple that are walking up the hill and you'll not give up. Look at those who have come before Hebrews have 12. Listen. Look at the older people in this congregation who are taking notes, who are pouring it out, who are visiting people, who are serving God, who are serving after this service, some of the people who are going say, I'm going to do a double. I'm going to worship one and serve one. Man, keep your eyes on the, keep your eyes on Jesus. Consider him who endured such opposition from sin. Why? So that you won't grow weary and lose heart. And your struggle against sin, just want to take note, you haven't resisted yet to the point of shedding your blood. We're, my wife and I are still riding high on this missionary conference. We got back. I'm eating dinner with Jim Childs one night of the one night of the um, uh, the event, 
And uh, I look at my wife, you know, she's doing her relational thing, going around the place packed out, about 600, 700 people at tables eating dinner. And she's going over and I look at, I look over, she's bawling like a baby. And uh, I'm like, oh, I guess we're not serving donuts tonight. She kind of, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> she's hugging these people and just crying. My wife grew up in Japan as a missionary kid. Second, second snowiest city in the entire world, 19 feet of snow on average. And I grew up in a home built by the original missionary, uh, used wood, no insulation, one wood-burning stove. Almost 20 years. So when she sees somebody that has been down that road, there's a primal connection. You can smell it. You can sniff it. So she met this, this couple. They're the roughs. They're retired missionaries. Sweetest couple, 20 years on the field in Japan. Back in the day when a letter took one to three months to arrive, you didn't have email and Facebook and all the things that many missionaries have this day. A few days ago, I got a letter uh, in the mail. And um, she was saying, our brief time with your wife talking in Japanese was delightful. Learning of her background as a missionary in northern Japan filled us with joy and admiration. Carry your response of welling up with tears and hugging us and calling us heroes when you learned that we had been there for 20 years. It warmed us. Boomerang. Boomerang. It, it matters what you do because others are going to imitate you. It matters that my sons see that I'm that I sacrifice for God or not. It ma that matters. It's it's a real deal. You are living a boomerang effect, whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not. It makes a difference. Here's the last thing before we close. It's about giving back to God. I don't speak a lot about this because we we have this conversation at a table for two, and we see that it makes a difference. So I don't speak a lot. It's part of our faith. It's a big part of our faith, and Jesus spoke a lot about giving back. Sometimes we give back our time. Sometimes we give back our finances, et cetera. So but let me just, let me, let me talk to you about giving back our finances. Here's why, here's why, as a shepherd, I need to talk to you about it. Now, as a pastor, I don't know what anybody gives in our church. I've made that decision. Part of the decision is I don't want to treat people any differently. You know, like the book of James says, hey, don't, if somebody's, you know, wearing fancy clothes and somebody's not, don't, don't treat them. No favoritism. That's not the way Christ works, right? So I, I don't want to know for that reason. So I, I literally don't know what one single person gives in the church. I also don't want to know because I'm not sure that I can shoulder the disappointment, if I'm honest. Why do I say that? Because in America of evangelicals, only two and a half percent are willing to give back a tithe to God. Two and a half percent. Now, I, our church, we did a survey a number of years ago, is, is different because of discipleship. So there are many of you. But let me kindly, as I start it, as a crucial conversation, hey, what I have to say to you might be a little difficult. But I'm saying it because I love you. Because our church is not in debt. Does that mean we don't need to pay the light bill and all that? Just no. But we're not hung up in that. So this, this, what I'm about to say is not driven by that. You can rest assured that is not my drive. Because I don't know what's, you know, I don't even handle the budget. Like, okay. I, they look, they give me a sheet this big with 100 million numbers on there. I'm like, looks good to me. <laughs> and they say, you got it upside down. Okay, I knew that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm saying it because we have a God that gave. 
we have a God that gives. And I just, as I was thinking through this this week, I'm like, what if God didn't give anything? And we'd have no eye, we'd have no uh, eyelids. He gave them to you, you know. We'd have no nitrogen. We'd have no oxygen. We'd have no heartbeat. We'd have zero if God didn't give anything, right? And so as we're giving back, it may be just a few thoughts. Second Corinthians 8, for you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was unbelievably rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might also become rich, not financially, spiritually. Romans 11, who has ever given to God that God should repay him? Watch, for from him and through him and to him are all things. If we could just put that on the t-shirt of our soul, it would really make a difference in the way that you see what's yours and what's not, because nothing is yours, basically. Let me, let me just let that settle in. For from God are all things, and through God are all things, and to God are all things. Jesus said it this way. Freely you have received, freely give. First Chronicles 12, 29, I love this. When David had acquired all these materials for the temple, he said, everything comes from you, God. We've only given back to you, boomerang, what comes from your hand. You see the boomerang? Everything came from you. We're just giving it back. So I never, you will never hear me, and never for years, never say you need to give to God. I don't believe that you should ever give to God. I believe you should give back to God. It was his to begin with. You're not giving anything. You're giving back. If I give you 10 apples and you give one back, you're just giving back what I already own. Plus, what if I made the apple tree and the dirt that the apple tree is planted in and the sun that you know makes the apple tree grow and the rain that you know waters it? I mean, just think about that. I mean, when you go get a carrot from Publix, it came from God. It didn't come from Ohio. <laughs> I mean, maybe it came from, you know, but it came from, it ultimately came from God. I mean, everything we're eating, Captain Crunch came from God. <laughs> Genesis chapter 28, Jacob had the same thought. He said, of all that you give me, I'm giving you a tenth back, man, boomeranging. So it is, it is challenging. If I might say this as we end. It is challenging to see if we have, as Christ followers, when we don't forgive. And I, I'm sometimes challenged with that, just being honest. My wife's an amazing forgiver. I have to, I'm more like the Tempur-Pedic pillow. It takes a little time to come back into shape. But this is the thing, man, that how can I not forgive that person when I am the recipient of a boomerang of forgiveness, of compassion. His mercy was new for me the moment I opened those eyelids this morning. His mercy is new every morning. Man, I'm the recipient. How can I not? Christ gave everything to the point of blood. How can I not sacrifice maybe an extra hour to serve somewhere, to, to stand in the parking lot or whatever, to sacrifice a little bit for the God who sacrificed everything? And how in the world as a Christ follower could I say, I'm keeping it all? How can I say that? So, to be honest with you, this thing doesn't work that great. <laughs> and man, <laughs> have I tried. And, um, and here's the reason I think it doesn't work well. So, I looked up this week. I'm like, let me look up the instructions again. And I don't know if you can see this on the screen, but <laughs> you see the, the words on the right corner, breeze, breeze, breeze. I'm like, did you have to put it three times? I mean, I got a breeze. And then on the left, you know, the good throw. And then on the bottom, if you aim too high, the orbiter lands to your left. You're darn right it does. Weak throw or not lean enough. So there's a lot of like, there's more wrong there. There's more resistance than there is. You just got one good throw in the midst of all that, right? So let me encourage you. 
If you think, man, I really wrestle with forgiving and loving people. And I should look through the eyes of Christ. I really wrestle with sacrificing. I kind of got into this Christianity game and I'm kind of kind of a recipient mode or I don't give anything to God. Financial, I don't give anything. Let me tell you why. It's hard to throw this thing. There's a lot of resistance around you. There's resistance like when you watch the news, everybody's mad at everybody. Have you noticed that? The left is mad at the right. The, the left is mad at the, the middle. The left is mad at the left left. You know, the right extreme is mad with the middle right. You know, I mean, everybody's, you know, mad. Then you have a talk show where I'll make sure we get the guy on the left and make sure we get the guy on the right. And then they're talking over each other and just seems so angry. I'm like, and then I'm like, I just feel stupid because I keep watching it. I keep getting angry at the guy who's not on my side of the aisle. And I keep doing it over and over and over. But see, that's conditioning. That's just how we treat each other. Then you go to the store, and it's all about you, man. And you look at the, you know, you look at the wardrobe and you buy the shirt because, man, it looked good on the GQ guy. And so it's about me. We live in a consumeristic. And so when you throw this thing. That's about how mine comes back. Hey, listen. This is tough, okay? This is tough. There's a lot of resistance in our culture. There's a lot of resistance in our sinful nature. And there's resistance in the dark realm of the world. I know that's heavy. There's a lot of resistance. Listen. The only way the boomerang comes back like God intends, you got to keep your eye on the right people. Keep your eye on Christ. Keep your eye on those who are great models. That's, that's the secret. I know it sounds simple, but you got to look at the people who are doing it. Use them as the model. Let me pray. Father, thank you for the model. You're always the model. Always, 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 always the model, God. We love because you first loved us. We forgive because we're forgiven. Let forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We have, we can have grit and perseverance and sacrifice, God, because you modeled that. And everything we have, everything we wear, everything we eat, everything we, where we go, everything, God, comes from you. We go to the beach. The beach is yours. You made the water, you made the sand, you made the sun, you made this, the clouds, you made the fish, you made, you made everything, you made the towel. And so God, today, just pray for what you're doing in each heart. I don't even know how to articulate that. God, I just pray that, that we'll act on the way you're, on what you're moving in us uniquely. Do we need to... How do we need to look like you more? Father, we pray for those who are looking for you. Maybe they're here in this room. Maybe they're at home. Maybe they're sitting in a car. Maybe they're in an apartment. Maybe they're sitting at a coffee shop. Doesn't matter where we're sitting. Church does, a church building does not make us more holy. Does not make us more, does not make you more accessible. So wherever you're sitting right now in this moment, and if you're looking for God, he has made himself known that we don't have to guess if he loves us. We don't have to guess if he's sacrificing. We don't have to guess if he's a giver. We know no man has ever seen God except the only begotten Jesus Christ who was in the bosom of the Father, and he has made him known. That while we were yet sinners, God demonstrates his love for us. In this, that he gave his son to die for us, to die for our sins so that we might know him. Do you know him today? Do you have a relationship with him? I'm not asking if you believe in God. I'm not asking if you 
generally agree with Christianity. I'm asking if you've taken your life and literally exchange it inwardly for God's new one. Come to him and say, God, I'm a sinner. I'm a broken egg. And I'm asking God for a new, I'm asking you to mend me, to heal me, to forgive me so that I can be right before your eyes, not through doing better, not by trying to get it right, not by going to a church, not by beginning to read the Bible, not becoming more spiritual, God, but by depending on Jesus Christ alone. I wonder if that just strikes you right between the eyes of your soul. Because if it does, God is, God is speaking to you. He's, he's directing you. Don't resist him. Pray, God, that you would just make things so clear for those that are looking, that are sensing your voice right now. And if you are sensing your, God's voice in your life, may I speak to you just very shortly here. Surrender. Listen, surrender to him. Submit your life to him. Loosen your grip completely on whatever you're depending on to be good enough to be with, to, to be a, to be a, in relationship with God. Just drop it and fall on Jesus. Speak to him and say, I leave behind all the things I'm trusting in. And I'm trusting in Christ right now who died for my sins. I'm trusting in Christ. Is that your prayer? I'm trusting in Christ. Would you ignite new life in me? God, I want to be your child. Is that your prayer? He's waiting. He's waiting. He's faithful. Father, thank you so much for your love, that you first loved us, that you first, you're the one that stepped up, gave your life. For that, God, we're thankful. Pray that we'll live, live a, a boomerang life, God, that our life will reflect all the things you've done for us in the power of Jesus' name. Amen.